got me into the mess. Okay. So he was doing radio then. Bolster was doing sales. Sales. Yeah. He just started as a just young sales. Oh, okay. He they and he him uh, over from Dubuque. Yeah. Right. right. And uh, Bolster and I had been at Loris College in Dubuque. Yeah. And then I transferred to Iowa. Mm -hmm. And I won't confuse you with all that, but no, uh, right. Because that whole time was. Uh, yeah. And One so then I was at KWWL from 1969. And I would say the first 18 months of that. Brian Ross started then. That's what um, I want to go over with you. Ross was there, yeah. um, a very talented guy, John yeah. McBride. Yeah. Of course, the on-air people, Dean Fryn, uh, yeah. my first assignment ever. Right. That, that whole trip. Well, again, we'll just, I just wanted to make, and, and I had your orientation just slightly. So I was 69 to, to make a long story short, I was 69 to 71 or 2. And, uh, and then I left uh, three of us, my, myself, McBride, actually four of us, mm -hmm. myself, McBride, John Emmert, yeah. and Brian Ross left for Miami. You all went to Miami. Yeah. Then. Okay. And um, I did a bunch of freelance work and, and a lot of drinking. <laughs> yeah. <All right. laughs> and uh, Gene Stroll had hired me at WCK-TV, uh, the NBC affiliate, mm -hmm. to work on documentary stuff. And... Um, it was about the time they eliminated documentaries from television. They lost the cigarette advertising. Mm -hmm. At least they did down there. And um, so then I resurfaced uh, when I, you and I got together. Right. And, um, Which would be mid about seven, 74. 74. Yeah. yeah. And then I went to Sioux City in right. 75. Yeah, I got it. And I was there for nine years. And then I was in Missouri for 16 years. And okay. KW for a year and a half. And here for about a year. Well, we'll just walk walk through it yeah. <coughs> kind of chronologically. Um, plan on you know taking about an hour. That's fine. Whenever you want to crank it up, Mike. And and well, <coughs> whatever the <Yep>. natural <coughs> life is, Grant. If we need another tape, we'll get one. And if it's shorter than that, that's fine too. No. Well, I expect to be able to do it okay. in an hour. Sure. Okay. Why don't you uh, Why don't you let it roll? <coughs> Okay, this is a um, broadcasting interview, history interview, which we're doing at the studios of WHO in Des Moines on uh, March 6th of 2003. Uh, my guest for uh, this interview is uh, a dear and longtime friend of mine, uh, Mike Beecher, and uh, he is uh, managing the news department here at WHO as we, um, as we speak. And here we are, uh, Mike, uh, in Jack Shelley land, WHO. We are. Grant, uh, I know you know this because you know me and my family, but um, as a young man, a young boy growing up in Iowa, um, there were two names that really popped out mm. that got me started uh, in news. One of them was Edward R. Murrow mm. in uh, television, uh, when I first learned about Edward R. Murrow in television. And, um, and the other one was, of course, Jack Shelley in his tradition. Uh, speaks for itself in Iowa, uh, uh, particularly in the radio days. This, not this building, but this set of call letters is the birthplace of broadcast news in Iowa and substantially in the United States. It's tremendous reputation. I'm privileged and honored to yeah. even be a small part of it. Right. Well, Mike, you've had a very interesting and successful career as a uh, starting as a reporter and photographer and, uh, and for many, many years now as a news manager uh, and have been my colleague over, over many of those years. So uh, this, this gets to be a little bit personal, but... Uh, That's fine. There's uh, no such thing as a bad question. <laughs> Only bad answers sometimes. But what I'd like to do is go through and uh, your career goes back to uh, the... Um, to the uh, citadel of uh, uh, Northeast Iowa Broadcasting, which is uh, Blackhawk Broadcasting in Waterloo, uh, founded by a man named R.J. McElroy, and then really turned into a highly successful enterprise by a giant by the name of Robert Buckmaster. And uh, you and I have both uh, worked for Buckmaster. So let's take you back to uh, you're graduating from the University of Iowa. Actually, uh, uh, my relationship, too, with um, Bob Buckmaster, uh, because of his association with my family and uh, eventually my father's law partner, um, I knew Bob even as a, as before I went to college and uh, <laughs> his family, of course. Yeah. And, uh, and I knew that he had a keen legal mind and was real interested. 
in certainly in Waterloo and um, and in ultimately and eventually in broadcasting. Mm -hmm. And of course, McElroy was a household name uh, if you lived in Waterloo. Wow. And although I didn't know him as well as I knew Bob, I knew of McElroy, and they they certainly were a key to what developed uh, later with Blackhawk Broadcasting. And then I did. Um, uh, after studying to be a Catholic priest <laughs> for uh, a brief period of Was time, that a right or a left turn? <laughs> during the rock and roll 1960s, I uh, matriculated <laughs> eventually to the University of Iowa after I left <laughs> Loris College in Dubuque, and uh, a, a college that I really enjoyed being a part of in Dubuque, a very rich uh, history as well. And uh, I was in Iowa City from about 1964 to 1969. And of course, as you know and others know, uh, that was a very turbulent time, uh, not only around the United States, but it was a fascinating time to be in college in a very politically active university like the University of Iowa uh, at a time when there were so many major historical movements in the United States. And probably my experience in Iowa City more than any one thing led me into a career in broadcast journalism. That and the circumstances mm -hmm. of life, but mm -hmm. I got to see what I uh, free speech out in the open, um, particularly during the Vietnam era, uh, mm -hmm. and it was a fascinating thing to see. And so it's you were there when the... Uh, I was there when they shut the university down. National Guard. And one of my first assignments as a young reporter was to go back to the university that I'd graduated from to cover the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement as it moved north yeah. and the women's movement as it developed in, mm -hmm. in Iowa. So you you were there as a reporter in those, uh, I have to say in my experience, absolutely the most exciting times in the 20th it century. It was, um, I was in my early 20s and it was, um, it was a, it, of course the college was shut down for two weeks and the National Guard was present. And um, regardless, regardless of your preference for or against the war, you were drawn into the movement somehow. Right. And um, it was, uh, you know, there were uh, a lot of tear gassing, um, a lot of very violent confrontations, uh, a lot of physical property damage. Throwing and it was just blocks a, off the top of the overpass. A, a and turbulent time. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I remember um, when I got my draft notice, um, being on a bus that left the, uh, in front of the post office in Iowa City um, one early one morning to bring uh, a group of us down to Camp Dodge here in Des Moines for our physicals, uh, which I fortunately flunked. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it was fortunate. Mm -hmm. I don't know how life would have played mm -hmm. out had I passed, but um, the, the bus was um, held hostage in Iowa City. Before we could get out of town, the windows on the bus were broke. We had uh, highway patrol escorts to uh, out of Iowa City, and uh, it was just a very turbulent time. Fascinating time, too, because you had uh, the Students for a Democratic Society, which had uh, kicked off in Michigan, and the University of Iowa, m the University of Michigan, uh, Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, uh, and Berkeley, uh, and, and a couple other colleges were major political hotbeds. They certainly so were. we had the primary um, opponents uh, and proponents of the anti-war movement, right. which really politicized the conservative nature of Iowa. Well, Mike, we could spend this next hour talking about your experiences as a reporter in that era, and I wish we'd have thought of that. We just brought more <laughs> tape, but uh, uh, well, that'll have to be for another time. So you, you're moved in this direction now. You have an association with uh, your uh, hometown uh, with this television station that uh, uh, McElroy had started uh, and which Buckmaster uh, took over to manage upon Mac's uh, premature death. And um, in effect what was happening is that um, you were starting to turn that into a real uh, news department at Channel 7. It was an interesting thing to watch. Um, I believe there were 22 people in the newsroom when uh, I hired on. They hired a bunch of uh, uh, young uh, men uh, who they put on what was called a below contract at the mm -hmm. time, and it yeah, meant right. that we worked for six days mm -hmm. and our gross was $125 and we thought we died and went to heaven. Mm -hmm. We were allowed to drive our own car and pay our own gas, mm -hmm. and uh, that became important because uh, we, we uh, 
we not only did AM and FM radio, but of course our primary service then, and the reason most of us were there was to do television news, which uh, even in the, in the uh, late 60s was still in its fairly uh, embryonic form. Very and, much uh, so. Still particularly for local television. Film, doing it film. So we divided up uh, our coverage area. Uh, we had a news director named Blake Kellogg who uh, uh, was, was a charming man and uh, originally from Wisconsin and um, had trained uh, German shepherds uh, during World War II and we <laughs> thought that was pretty good training for his supervisory uh, requirements in that newsroom. But it was a fascinating time. You were caught up in the history of it all. My first uh, beat uh, and we were assigned beats, mm. uh, other than to do a radio beat, we were sent out into the region. And I was sent to Dubuque, Iowa, mm -hmm. where I'd been a student at Loris College and I knew the ropes. And uh, we had a terrific story there during the Civil Rights Movement where the university, uh, the college president uh, was taken over uh, uh, and, and, and quarantined in his office. And, and that really had Dubuque on pins and needles for a number of weeks when the Civil Rights Movement moved mm -hmm. north. And then uh, the other major assignment that I had was to cover Iowa City mm -hmm. and, uh, of course, the anti-war demonstrations. But we had a newsroom at the time, Grant, of people who, uh, uh, um, and it's easy to romanticize it as you become an older man, mm -hmm. but um, news wasn't a career choice. For us, it was really a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. uh, we were all single or or those of us that were married were about <laughs> to be single and didn't <laughs> know it because we lived in that newsroom. Mm -hmm. and. Um, we, uh, there was no such thing as uh, any overtime requirements or anything. No. And it was a wonderful newsroom to be in. And I think it's really important to, in this, uh, in this interview, to point out that Channel 7, under McElroy's management, was never going to amount to much as a news operation. It sim he simply didn't have the vision for it. He didn't. And Buckmaster did. But you were up against uh, a juggernaut at uh, down the street at Channel 2. We were just getting clobbered. Um, well, and had been for years. We had been. We were the, the poor kids on the block, and our, our equipment reflected it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the station was getting little, if any, revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, even in the late 60s, television news really hadn't been the profit center it eventually became. And in some ways, we were tolerated. But Buckmaster had the vision, I think, with his, his astute legal mind, and he traveled a lot, too. And he had a real sense of community and, the, and what, what, how journalism lent itself to what he found very important, and that was the law, yeah. uh, which gave society, even Waterloo, Iowa, and Dubuque, Iowa, the structure that was important for the context of life. And so Buckmaster um, uh, really supercharged that, helped fund it, uh, helped us tough it out, stood behind us when, when people wanted uh, news in Waterloo, Iowa to be um, uh, news candy instead of true journalism. And uh, he, would, uh, he would go to bat for us on legal issues, and we were a very aggressive newsroom. Right. And we took on, we traveled to Des Moines regularly, and mm -hmm. we just took on anybody. And, uh, and not in a mean-spirited way, because that wasn't our intent. But no, in terms but it of was aggressive news coverage. It really and was, yeah. And again, it, it would be important to, we don't have time to go into it, but there was a real war in Waterloo when it came to uh, the... KXCL. Uh, and well, no, I'm thinking of the, um, of the, pro of the, of the, uh, of the... Civil rights. The civil yeah, rights yeah. issue, the, you know, 4th Street. You yeah, my you I was there, there when in 69 was burning. when that erupted. And, yeah. um, we wore helmets and, and bulletproof vests in 1969 in Waterloo, Iowa. That's right. And I wore helmets and bulletproof vests in um, Iowa City when we covered anti-war demonstrations. And our students today, have n they, yeah. they don't know that happened. You went out with your, you, there were times when, and ironically, I moved to Sioux City, which you may want to get into, we where I covered the uh, Iowa beef processors, uh, Dakota City, Nebraska Another strike. Another war. <laughs> and I was maced over there, <laughs> or tear gassed over there. Yeah. So it was really an interesting early uh, time in history in our, my career. Um, the, um, so Tom Peterson had been brought aboard as... A, Tom was the anchor man Tom at was the, the time. Anchor when and, you um, came Jim Ganaw was the young weatherman, yeah. maybe the youngest in the country at High the school time. kid when he started. Yeah, he was a high school kid. And uh, uh, Mike O'Connor did sports. Yeah. He was the nephew of Bucky O'Connor, who'd been the Iowa basketball coach. Yeah. And um, 
of course, we had the radio end of it with Eldon Ebert, yeah. and then Dean Frein was kind of the uh, anchor of the newsroom in terms of content. He was a he knew, knew the where Simon the, editor. He and knew where the news was. He really did. He had a uh, he was a fine journalist. Wonderful man. And um, so it was a real gung ho gung ho crew, and um, we uh, we did what uh, I learned later in in my career was very important. Uh, we established ourselves credibly with the viewers of that area on the street with our reporting. Mm -hmm. It wasn't our anchoring that got got us to where we eventually got, and it wasn't our weather. It was content. And it wasn't our sports. It was our news content. And when I went into a number three station years later in Sioux City, mm -hmm. uh, we decided that we had to win on the street first, mm -hmm. and that was a lesson that I learned at KWWL in Waterloo. Right. We knew how to cover City Hall. And I will tell you, as I, you know, I was with, I was the guy you were shooting at down there at Channel Two, and 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 you notched several notches in your <laughs> in your handle of that six shooter, and we were starting to feel uh, Channel Seven's ratings started to to move up, and um, that eventually would completely reverse in the um, in the 70s uh, that would follow it did but the momentum for that was established while you were there during that period of time that you've just described uh, which i just think is is so so terribly significant but let me ask you now about brian ross <laughs> who is you know sits across from uh, peter jennings these days sure. and debriefs him on his latest investigative report well, Brian, uh, there are people that have different opinions about his style, but I can tell you from my experience with Brian that that he is uh, singularly the most prolific uh, broadcast news journalist that I've ever worked with in terms of the amount of stories that he produced, at least at the at the peak of his career. And I I know he's he's investigated now, so the numbers of stories yeah. aren't the same. But uh, he was also the most assertive. Um, interviewer that's that the I've kindest word that's ever been that used I for. that <laughs> I remember mm. you have to remember in my case in 1969 Brian was polite mm. <laughs> as polite of any as any of us and of course we didn't know where his career would take him <laughs> and I'm not sure he knew where his would either but it was easy to tell early on that he was gifted and, and very articulate had a tremendous passion for broadcast news um, he he didn't see uh, he saw news as I think many of us did as we, we felt we were living history, and, and so we weren't asking questions then, and Brian certainly wasn't to advance careers. We just wanted to get the answer to things that we thought were important. Interesting perspective. And really were life and death matters. Yeah. You had young men that were getting drafted into a war. Uh, they could leave Grunny Center and six, six weeks be back in a, in a, in a box and, and uh, with very limited training, and there were a lot of issues then, uh, not just the war. But, uh, but that was a big part of it. Let me digress just mm -hmm. a moment. We're in, this is 2003. On this very day as we speak, the president is going to address the nation, and all probability next week we're going to be at war. It would Iraq. appear there'll be a military And act. nobody has been asking those questions. Well, Brian certainly would have asked those, and um, you're right. I think the, 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 the history of broadcasting has changed. Um, in some ways, we've, we've become, if I can digress, we've become... Uh, more lap dogs than bulldogs, and uh, Brian certainly was a bulldog, and and um, and I know his career was controversial, but I um, I we used to shoot for each other in those days. You mm -hmm. weren't just a reporter; mm -hmm. you were a reporter photographer. So uh, there were many days when I'd go out with Brian, and he'd be the reporter, and and I'd shoot for him, and and vice versa, he'd shoot for me, and um, I learned a lot from Brian, even though uh, he was my age. He'd He'd had some training that I didn't have, and um, but he was very schooled politically for uh, a young man, mm -hmm. and he he had a very uh, keen insight into how uh, government worked or didn't work, mm -hmm. uh, the interrelationships of uh, politicians. How the, he kn he knew a lot about power, and he knew how to cover power. Mm -hmm. <coughs> he wasn't the only one in the newsroom, I might add. Yeah. Uh, there were Bob Holitz, and there were some others in there that really had. Uh, a good sense to know is Dean Frein uh, right. was very sophisticated journalistically. Well, uh, Brian uh, Brian took on any comers. Um, one of the most interesting stories I had with Brian, um, and I say this respectfully, um, was with the then Senator John Culver. Mm -hmm. um, 
Brian had chosen to take him on one day in Old Wine, Iowa. And um, it was on an important Senate vote or a political matter. I can't remember the exact issue, but I was there as a photographer. And we walked into a restaurant, and uh, Senator Culver was meeting uh, literally in the back room. I don't mean that in a clandestine mm -hmm. way, but there was a drape that no. came across the, separated the restaurant from the back room. And, and Brian and I got back in there, and Brian got in there first, and we weren't welcome, to say the least. And Culver uh, is and was a big man. Uh, he was at the prime of his, his, his manhood then. And I remember Brian being picked up and, and coming back through that curtain at me in that, uh, in that restaurant that day. And uh, there was quite a heated exchange. But we did go out of there with an interview with a soundbite that day and <laughs> made it back with our lives. I, I also remember a day in, uh, <laughs> with Brian when I was shooting. And he wanted to find out why the Highway Patrol was holding this uh, secret meeting. And um, I remember uh, a Highway Patrolman, who I'm sure by now is deceased, <laughs> uh, but picking Brian up by the, by the sport coat or suit. He always wore a suit. He didn't wear a sport coat. <laughs> and banging Brian down on the hood of a hi Iowa Highway Patrol car. <laughs> and I had the film rolling. I mean, we rolled on that. And I remember we had quite a controversy when we got back to the station as to whether or not we would air that. Mm -hmm. But Brian was very aggressive. And then, of course, in Miami, I, I watched him in Miami as his career really took off. And, and of course, he, Brian has certainly proved um, in many, many ways as a national correspondent and in his investigative work that he is the kind of a journalist that you thought that you knew him as and has never really deviated never changed from that. no he uh, took a lot of heat yeah. uh, he's been controversial oh, he he's probably done things he might do over like all of us right he was a wonderful writer in the broadcast style he was very quick he would look at you with his eyes right. and be typing at the same time and he uh, he had a great deal of respect for the people who worked with mm -hmm. him uh, he never forgot the little guys that he started out with and um, and it's it was fun to watch his career develop I know there were managers that boy he would really rub the wrong way oh of course yeah. Yeah, right well we must move on Mike um, you uh, with some, with your sort of band of brothers there um, decided to to take your uh, skills to uh, uh, t to Sunland. Well, with you your your help uh, I, I eventually come back for a brief time in Waterloo and mm -hmm. um, you were kind enough to uh, help me reacquaint myself with Iowa, and well, why uh, don't you you did sort of you took you you went to uh, I spent a year and a half or a year in Miami, in Miami, and I came back. I missed the Midwest, mm -hmm. and I um, wanted to get back in a primary broadcast role, and um, had dealt really with some personal issues too mm -hmm. uh, as a young man that um, uh, that weren't particularly profound, although they seemed to be at the time, but. Um, came back to Waterloo and, and I think with a new identity having spent some time in, uh, in another atmosphere and um, really had a, a new vision of what I wanted to do and really committed to broadcast journalism mm -hmm. and was fortunate enough to have people like yourself who took it seriously. And uh, it was at a nice time historically when Blackhawk Broadcasting was expanding and out in your old turf in Sioux right. City. And, um, bought a beat up station that nobody else I guess would have and uh, uh, in some ways and um, so I went out there as a reporter and eventually became the news director. And you went to, uh, um, to KTIV, KTIV Channel 4 TV. in Sioux City which at the time and for some time prior to that had been housed in the basement of the pool hall. We were in the basement <laughs> of the pool hall <laughs> when, uh, when I started there and um, we had an interesting crew there too but um, the station was at an absolute low ebb, but that uh, they had just been pummeled into the dust by KCAU Channel 9, and uh, they had a caretaker for my dear old friend Jack Todd. Jack Todd would, would pick up the Sioux City Journal in the morning, yeah. and whatever was in the Sioux City Journal mm. was on KTIV. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and some things that weren't that might have been ad-libbed. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. but that uh, that was the station that Bla that um, that Blackhawk Broadcasting bought, and uh, and uh, <coughs> we sent a couple of very talented young men over there to uh, to help out with the uh, resuscitation process. One of them was Steve you, and then the other one was Steve Ridge. Steve Ridge, who le w went on to become the executive uh, vice president of Frank Maggot and Associates right. in Marion. 
and Steve covered the county beat and I covered the city beat and eventually did a lot of political reporting, uh, both of us. Um, and I also did a lot of work at the assignment desk. In those days, in a smaller newsroom, you really did everything. Right. I'd it was a very weekend small Weekend anchor. Uh, we had to hire. We didn't have any qualified people in the newsroom at the time. No. Uh, we, the company took that over. and We and had one we, news car. Right. We had a couple Bell and Howell cameras. I think we had one camera that we could shoot uh, sound on mm -hmm. if it worked. <laughs> right. uh, a beat up studio. Mm -hmm. um, I remember anchoring when a guy would tune the engine up on his car in the adjacent room and <laughs> and you'd, you'd hear him over the air. You'd hear right. his tweaking his engine on his car in the next room and there would be billiard balls bouncing mm -hmm. on the up tables above. up over us and it was and Tom Brokaw of course had a brief stint there prior to my time right. there but it was an interesting time. It was an interesting time and a and a good news city. Sioux City is a great news city. It has always had been. a lot going on. Right. But what we s what started to build there again now we're um, Blackhawk by this time is really establishing itself as a <coughs> station that's <coughs> excuse me seriously does news and uh, was transferred to We Sioux really city. took it for real. <coughs> and um, the um, and I think Steve and I fed off each other, and of course those of you in Waterloo that we were in daily contact with, I know you and I talked on the phone I think every day about what happened in Western Iowa. And I later did some quite a bit of work for the Des Moines Register out of Western Iowa because they didn't have a correspondent out there. So we really took journalism and broadcast journalism quite seriously. And you started getting out and competing with Channel 9 covering the news we in did. Sioux City. Started in the in the core. <laughs> we did. We we decided that we would go to basically what we did is I told Steve I'll take the city <laughs> hall and Steve took the the county and we never missed a meeting mm. uh, of any kind and in those days you went to meetings because you learned the inner workings of power and you identified all the issues <laughs> and <laughs> you knew who the players were and the public liked you for that. They if you could break and we broke stories all the time that maybe the other guy wouldn't go to and we didn't we did a lot of what today would be considered to be pretty boring television, and it wasn't graphically but it was news. enhanced, but there were stories there that, right. that needed to be told and that we told, and, and some that, that the established uh, community didn't want told. Because uh, they hadn't been told. That's <laughs> right. And yeah. then, of course, the real major events that developed in Sioux City at the time, um, and, and, and this was, I left right before the, the tragic plane crash, but mm. The biggest story <coughs> up until then, Grant, was the the uh, evolution of Iowa beef processors in Dakota City, Nebraska. Modern meat packing at war Box with the beef old system, right? Was moving out and breaking the union that the Amalgamated Meat Cutters Union and the packing plants that had been part of Sioux City's rich history for many years, and it was the beginning of a new era. Right. And it 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 ended up with the National Guard being called in to quell the strike and. Uh, that was a fascinating time. And there was also a lot of corruption in government in Sioux City, Iowa. Always had been. More so than in any other city in Iowa I'd been in, maybe with the exception of Dubuque, but particularly Sioux City. It was had to do with no liquor by the drink. <laughs> it was an interest, and of course you had South Dakota just up the river right. and Nebraska across the river. So it was a fascinating city. But actually, uh, <coughs> there, uh, if I recall the story, there, there, were, there were machine guns on the roof of that there were. They had plant in Dakota City, Nebraska. There were, they had turrets <laughs> mounted, and um, <coughs> they, uh, they would be mounted. Uh, and I, I remember the famous Des Moines Register photograph of the National Guard and turrets um, <coughs> in Dakota City, Nebraska, which, of course, as you know, was right across the r river from Sioux City, in near South Sioux City. And they had a <laughs> county sheriff there, um, the, the county sheriff in Dakota County, and all his deputies wore, rode on horseback. Mm -hmm. And so we'd, the press would go out in the morning to Dakota City, Nebraska, if we hadn't stayed out there all night. It was like a war <laughs> zone. Yeah. And um, you, uh, you had uh, the folks that worked in the uh, uh, plants <laughs> that... Uh, the, the slaughterhouses and they were all armed with knives yeah. on the picket lines and um, and you were there as media and you had the National Guard and you had the IOV processor employees uh, and any of the so-called scabs that crossed the line and it was violent every day. But the Dakota City, Nebraska sheriff would come in much to the um, 
uh, chagrin of the uh, National Guard, and he'd come in on horseback with his posse, and they'd ride along the press line and, and mace the press <laughs> if we didn't move back, and, or tear gas, the mace, mm. whatever they used. The standard procedure. Yeah. So that was a violent, <laughs> long-standing feud in, in Sioux City that eventually mm. ended up with uh, uh, the Meat Cutters Union being broken. Being broken and, and of course, created a whole new era uh, in the packing industry. Of box and that's another two or three hour that's right. story. That's right. but, but you were out there uh, and you, again, were still pretty limited staff uh, trying to cover a story of that magnitude. We, we had a limited staff. And another interesting story that I was proud of at the time uh, that we took on, um, rather early out there, uh, a, a city councilman had been um, dipping into federal funds. Mm -hmm. And another reporter and I, uh, uh, a young man named Gene Ambrosian, and he was young at the time, mm -hmm. did a series of, I think, about 51 stories on this city councilman who uh, coincidentally had worked at Iowa Beef Processors in management and had set up a dummy, what the government considered eventually to be a dummy uh, corporation. Mm -hmm. And as a result of those stories, uh, which almost lost us our job mm. because the U.S. Attorney bailed out in the 11th hour and we thought he was going to hand down indictments. Mm. Fortunately, IRS was watching all of our reports and, and this particular city councilman spent three years in a federal penitentiary as a result That's of our reports. It's a sinking feeling when they decide not to prosecute. It is. It? it was a sinking feeling mm. and we went home and told our loved ones we may be moving. Yeah. <laughs> and then the next day the IRS came out and, and uh, indicated they were indicting this gentleman as a result of our reports mm. and, and he spent three years in, in, in a federal penitentiary. This is real journalism and, and again it's a part of the story. So you evolved into the news directorship. I Mike. did. I eventually became the news director at KTV. It really came down to whether Steve Ridge or I wanted to go up front mm -hmm. and talk to the old man and <laughs> And I know that behind the scenes there was there were discussions, I'm sure, at different levels of Blackhawk. And Steve had a, a, a wonderful uh, gift uh, and went on uh, to become a, a manager elsewhere mm. and then eventually went into consulting. Right. And I stayed very, in the primary. Very talented guy. I've stayed in the primary mm. areas and eventually went on to become vice president of news uh, mm. at KTIV. And, of course, we moved from the old building and helped design the new building on Signal Hill. And we moved into that. I believe it was about 1976 or 77, okay. somewhere in okay. there. Okay, I'd sort of lost maybe even a little bit later mm -hmm. than that. It could have been a little bit later. So out of this, <coughs> pretty much of a dungeon of a place, and, and not to demean, because KTIV does have an early distinguished uh, history too. They were there yeah. for uh, uh, they, but it really deteriorated under hassles with management. We pretty much started from ground zero. Oh, absolutely. And we, won, <laughs> and we won on the street. Mm -hmm. uh, a small group of reporters won on the street by covering city beat and the county beat. And then you went on then to establish regional We coverage. went out regional and we became the number one station in, in Sioux City. And I might add that <coughs> others, there were some wonderful competitors there. Mm -hmm. Dave Nixon, yeah. uh, I competed against in Sioux City. And I eventually hired him. Mm -hmm. I helped him move to Des Moines as a matter of fact, to WHO TV. <coughs> uh, and then he, I hired him out of WHO and brought him back to Sioux City and hired his son as well. Mm -hmm. But Dave became our primary anchor man, and that certainly helped us go regional and establish ourselves as number one. Uh, let me, um, let me point, I was going to sort of lost my train of thought here for a second. Oh, well, I wanted to make the, um, uh, it get into the record here, that Channel 9 was as overwhelmingly dominant in the Sioux City market uh, as Channel 2 was in the uh, Eastern Iowa, Eastern market, Iowa over market KWW. at the time you went over there. That's right. I mean, they were getting, uh, they say, 90 shares. Uh, they were, and their, and their, their uh, general manager and, and president was uh, the head of the forward group and Bill Turner and the, and the head of the ABC affiliates board. I mean, they were a station that was really they were a cutting real powerhouse. edge broadcasting, and as was their group. Yeah. And we were... We were a, a dismal last place. It wasn't even a close call. Yeah, right. So <coughs> Blackhawk, mm, they went into they went in to win, and you were part of the winning team. That's right. And they got out of the dungeon, built a really nice facility. Uh, you called it Signal Hill. Out, we built out KTIV on, on Signal Hill. Northeast, uh, northwest, and 
Northeast Sioux City. That's right. Mm -hmm. It was out by KSCJ Radio, mm -hmm. and um, <coughs> at the time they had their uh, mm -hmm. little uh, studio out there. It was a nice radio studio, of course, and, um, but that was the new part of Sioux City mm -hmm. then. And of course, we designed it thinking that it would uh, be a building that would stand, withstand the ages, and, and television news just boomed at that time, and we, we kind of quickly outgrew it, although mm -hmm. it's still there and still doing well from what I understand. But you <coughs> now you're building um, you're you're building a not only a news gathering team but you're starting to build um, personalities we into are. the mix which become necessary. Uh, who are some of the I've kind of forgotten now who some well of your some of the key people mm -hmm. out there. Um, Bruce Scheid, who um, who's still in Sioux City at KTIV, uh, had become our farm director, and he was there. When I showed up, mm -hmm. then is he was the day. one probably professional that was left. He there. was out of that crew. Yeah. Um, we had uh, Dave Town. Uh, uh, hi I hired Dave. I think one of my first hires, or perhaps you did, and no. he was sent over there. Mm -hmm. One of us, either you or I, hired no, Dave hired Town, him. and uh, mm -hmm. he came over from Nebraska and started his uh, career there. Uh, he went on, of course, to do, to do a fine job uh, mm -hmm. elsewhere, and. Uh, Fred Ertz, um, who went on to become an anchor man at Kello in Sioux Falls, mm -hmm. South Dakota. Steve Ridge, of course. Um, Joanne Merrigan went on to become a reporter in <coughs> California. Uh, Mike O'Connor left um, KWWL and spent a time in Sioux City. And I also hired Bob Hogue, who was on the air in <coughs> Sioux City, who eventually <coughs> went on to <coughs> KWWL in Waterloo and became now their sports director. Here comes the here comes home base stealing your talent. That's right. And uh, that was a real talent. The mother load <laughs> stole Bob Hogue. Who became the, the voice of the, the Hawkeyes, Iowa Hawkeyes on the Iowa Television At network. a time when uh, that network was the hottest basketball network in the country. And that was a big help to Channel 4 in, uh, in Sioux City it because really you were one of those We were part stations. of the network. We were the NBC affiliate in Western Iowa. And, and it helped our revenue, and it helped underwrite a lot of things. Probably built the biggest shares for local programming of anything that's been on the air. It was big business. We had a young man, or we had an anchor who I terminated, and we later became good friends in life before <laughs> he died, <laughs> Charles Tornell. Tornell. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he, he was the first lawsuit that I was involved in as a news director, <laughs> and years later we met and laughed and patched things <laughs> up rather quickly. <laughs> Terry Zahn, uh, the late Terry Zahn, Terry went on to become an anchor in uh, the Quad Cities and also uh, at WAVY in Norfolk. And before so you were bringing talent, <coughs> talent we were. the small market, 120? At the time we were 113. 113. When I left to go to Missouri, mm -hmm. we were 113. Mm -hmm. And we'd become the number one station in the market. We had metro ratings and, and regional DMA ratings, mm -hmm. regional ratings. About what point did that uh, happen, Mike? I think it flashed. About the time Dave Nixon came, I would say about 1980 mm -hmm. to 1982, we became number one. And I, I rode the uh, crest of that for a few years, and Dave Nixon and I worked together for two or three years, and he really helped at the talent level. Dave was the yeah. first major well, let's, talent. Let's go back to, to the Nixon story now, because it's, it's a really important. You know, I have always had trouble with, with the disproportionate role of personalities in broadcast news, mm -hmm. but it's a reality that is there. That's right. And Nixon, of course, came into that mix at Channel 9 and was a very important factor in building the dominance that they had established. Oh, he was, the, he was it. Yeah. Uh, that, that's not to discredit others, but when you thought of KCAU, you thought of Dave Nixon. Dave Nixon. And he was their news director and he was their primary anchor. Right. And he and I really competed with each other. Yeah. Uh, in fact, he tried to hire me, <laughs> bring me as a reporter to KCAU, and I later ended up, when I became news director, hiring him out of Des Moines, bringing him back in, to Sioux City. And even when I brought him back, mm -hmm. there was a little tension in the relationship. We became good friends over the years. And of course, there's a lot of there's a lot of dynamics involved here. Channel Four is challenging Channel Nine now. And Nixon is, is no longer see the going, writing on not the going to be the king. That's right. So Des Moines is the biggest market in Iowa. So he decided to try his uh, his fortunes down there, and they hired him as a primary anchor at this. He station. came to WHO, and he did a nice job. Mm -hmm. Gerald Jensen was the news director mm -hmm. then, and but Dave missed uh, his power base, which was really Northwest of Iowa, and mm -hmm. he was up against KCCI. Although he did very well against KCCI, mm -hmm. and he didn't leave here with his tail between his legs, but he wanted to come back home. 
And the bait was I'd hired his son, uh -huh. and I knew if I got his son in there, I'd get Dave. So you hired Junior before? I hired Junior before I hired Senior. Right. And uh, it was a father-son thing. It was fun to watch. And uh, But when Nixon came back into that market and shows up on Channel 4, we really were legitimized. Then you were rolling. We were. It was, uh, the game was over, so to speak. Right. Um, and uh, we had not only the good street reporters, and we had wonderful photographers, uh, we had a good on-air team, but Nixon was the catalyst that really drove us mm. uh, and really secured our lead. Mm -hmm. and, and it was an image thing, too. Uh, viewers knew that the power had shifted from one station to the other, and it was an exciting thing to watch. Right. And, of course, you know, we really didn't give a damn about ratings then, and we really don't, we really don't even today, but it's part of our reality. Well, it's the reality. Yeah. It's the reality because the resources that you had to have to do what you did are driven by income from That's advertising. Right. And I learned <laughs> so that. So you can't escape it. You can't. You and the thing I like, too, about Nixon, and I'll say this, having worked with a lot of anchors since mm. Nixon, when that red light went on the camera, Dave was on the edge of his seat. Right. And like all of us, he had his faults, but he really engaged viewers. He cared about viewers. He, he liked good, clean copy. He didn't like foolishness. He didn't He's like carelessness by production. He took a, a bright, lot of pride. Bright guy and, and took a lot of now and the wonderful dean. communicator, right. just a natural communicator. Uh, and and that's a part of the mix. Yeah. And he and I used to kid around at Dave didn't have a college degree then. Yeah. And I said, Dave, you ought to finish your education sometime. Mm -hmm. This is before I left Sioux City. And we fussed about it a little mm -hmm. bit. But finally he said, Okay, I'll take some classes at Morningside. He took some classes quietly at Morningside. He'd go to classes in the morning, yep. come in in the afternoon. Well, lo and behold, I get a call after I transferred to Missouri. Nixon not only got his undergraduate degree at Morningside, went on to get his master's and eventually his Ph.D. at the University of South Dakota. And is now the academic dean at the uh, es Esterville campus. Es Esterville. Em Emmitsburg campus. Emmitsburg campus, of yeah. North Iowa. North but a great story yeah. and a very well-respected journalist in, Indeed, in Western Iowa. Indeed, a bright guy. Yeah. So now um, you're, uh, we're in the 80s and are, we're in under the ownership of the Aflac. Blackhawk uh, gets bought out by mm -hmm. Aflac, as you know. And it's the first time that we leave what was a small community-based company mm -hmm. and more or less begin to move into the mainstream of yeah. American broadcasting, even though Aflac was a relatively small group. Right. Uh, but it was a different e si uh, economic size. and. I was asked to move to uh, their large station at the CBS station in Missouri, and so I uh, hated to leave Iowa and would love to have uh, gone back home to Waterloo, but in the mystery of my life, and of course it's worked out for mm. the best in more ways than I could admit, um, I ended up going to Missouri and um, uh, retooled the CBS affiliate down there based on what I learned in Iowa. and. We became the number one station there, and I was there for 16 years as uh, the news director of, of the CBS affiliate. And you, uh, that's, I hadn't thought about it, but you had already worked in a, uh, in a triple hyphenated uh, market. I had. In Sioux City, we had parts of four states and three Indian reservations. <laughs> right. And when I went to Missouri, <laughs> I had parts of five states. Five states. And with the Mississippi River running and, right and through Cape the middle. And Cape Girardeau is a a little town. Halfway between Memphis and St. Louis, right. and a beautiful, beautiful place. city right on the Mississippi River, and um, mostly we broadcast for southern Missouri and southern Illinois. Right, but you had Paducah, Kentucky, I had Western with the Kentucky. NBC. I had the high school shooting, the first high school shooting in Paducah, Kentucky. Yeah. I had the great 1993 flood, which took us six months to cover on yeah. the Mississippi. Uh, we had earthquakes, the great earthquake scare of 1990 with Dr. Ivan. Mike Beecher Ivan got called home from RTNDA to cover an earthquake in Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go back to Missouri from California to cover <laughs> an earthquake. And um, we had a real good crew, but the model had been established, at least in my mind, back in Iowa. So it wasn't difficult. And <coughs> the formula was there. We won on the street first, and we recruited some really great talent. And to this day, and it's become just like KTIV. And Mm. It's a better station after I left than it was when I was there, but uh, a lot of the colleagues that I worked with helped establish those bases. They're but still successful The stations. principles, again, were still... Uh, Hard-nosed journalism. ...honored in the ownership <coughs> that um, of 
under the under the Aflac manage. Leroy Paul Leroy Paul was a he was a lot like Bob Buckmaster. He was a tough-minded businessman, but he understood that there's a wall between news coverage That's and right. business. He respected that, and he respected it. And then as things evolved, grudgingly occasionally, he, I think. he did. <laughs> and I, I, he, I think he, his heart was in the right place. Yeah. And, uh, he was a good businessman, and by now news had become a big gentleman. business. Right, he was. He, he was a gentleman. And then, eventually, um, um, my last two or three years in Missouri, uh, Raycom Media bought out Aflac, mm. and so I worked for even a larger company, which uh, I believe at the time I left uh, had upwards of thirty some stations. I think their number is somewhere around thirty five right. yeah. now. Yeah. Well, that brings us again to uh, sort of we're coming full circle now. Mike Beecher is now working for Raycom, uh, which is part of the megamania, and uh, megamania, that's a Freudian slip there, uh, status of American broadcasting today. Yeah, uh, I got to see how the big companies The work. barriers were broken down by the Telecommunications Act of 1996 which totally removed the limits on ownership on radio right. stations nationally, substantially watered it down for television, so that uh, investment-minded uh, entrepreneurs uh, were buying up television stations following the 96 Act, and Raycom was formed out of that. Phenomenon. Absolutely, they evolved out of that, and and it was it was very unabashedly a, a profit motif that drove the origins of the company and to this day still do uh, mm -hmm. and I think you could say that about any large group or any group for that matter. They aren't any different yeah. than, than the others. But the ethic, the small town ethic that KWWL had, that KTIV in Sioux City had, that mm -hmm. KFES in Cape Girardeau had, uh, really began to dissolve that local ownership and of course the case could be made that well somebody had to sell it to them but Mm. These local broadcasters weren't big enough to stay in the game, and they, they really had to sell, and of course they were getting a good price for it, too, well, what the they thought was a good price. Well, then. one of the things that the bright boys at Raycom did is pay way too much for almost all Well, the they did. They, they overpaid bought. for the properties. They had enormous debt to retire. Mm. Uh, a, a bunch of us got caught in the middle of that, some of us who were late mm. in our careers, and um, uh, when the economy turned south, um, and the other thing is, uh, and I say this uh, as honestly as I can, but consultants came into newsrooms too along the line, and mm -hmm. uh, they're really uh, news became marketing and audience driven, and the revenue objectives were there. And I think we lost. Uh, well, I know we lost some wonderful people that just got out, well, and just left the business because their their heart was no longer in it. Well, and of course, you and I have had personal engagement with uh, with what you just described. Yeah. Now the, <coughs> this company uh, uh, prevails on you to do something that you'd really always kind of wanted to do, and that is uh, come back to Waterloo. Well, and, sometimes and you get it. what you pray for. <laughs> 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 and uh, although I have absolutely no regrets, mm. but I, um, I, was, uh, I, I was asked uh, ultimately to uh, consider being the news director at KWWL in Waterloo, where I started as a reporter years ago. Yeah. So about 30 years into my career, uh, I found myself moving back to Iowa, which uh, I, I'd longed for uh, for many years, and uh, um, my hometown, and uh, brought back a lot of memories, and reconnected certainly with the ethic that was uh, uh, planted there years ago. Uh, there were a lot of ghosts in the newsroom of KWWL. <laughs> When I walked in there after being, and I was physically, I think, out of the building for over 25 years. Mm -hmm. So, um, and they'd mm -hmm. remove the move the newsroom around, what have you. But I went back to work with a colleague, Jim Waterbury, who I'd worked with uh, in Sioux City in the Aflac organization. That's right. Jim was his first year as general manager. Mm -hmm. I was news director mm -hmm. in Sioux City, and had already been there when he arrived. Mm -hmm. And so Jim and I were friends, and thought I wanted to come back really after Grant Price had left mm -hmm. and do what I could to help um, uh, make sure that the, that the ethic uh, was still there in Waterloo, Iowa. And it was somewhat of a grandiose notion on my part because uh, I was cognizant of the fact that, like Thomas Wolfe said, you can never really go home again, and, and I, I, I subscribed to certain parts mm -hmm. of that. But I spent um, a good, a really good year, uh, a little bit more than a year, maybe a year and 
a half, a year and a quarter, with some wonderful people in the newsroom, yeah. um, some of whom, unfortunately, uh, uh, their demise was there uh, shortly before my demise. And um, I resigned from KWWL, but it was under duress, and it was under the, the duress that mm -hmm. some of us, um, some of the senior broadcast journalists, if I can use that word, at least in a loose sense, uh, the Gary Sarnoffs of the world, mm -hmm. uh, uh, some of the people that had spent quite a few years in, in that eastern Iowa market that were forced for various reasons to move on. And, uh, well, so it was a little bittersweet, but, mm -hmm. but looking back on it now from Des Moines and, and uh, with some time under the belt, I have no regrets, and I'm very proud of the fact that uh, even for a short while, mm -hmm. I was the news director at KWWL. In well, Colorado, and, Ohio. And, and you did a fine job with it under very difficult circumstances. Uh, and I need to point out that um, that to give the whoever is watching this, whenever it is, the sort of the the signal in the wind was when Jim Waterbury told the Affleck folks, "I ain't going to do this." Yeah. He had managed that. He came back to Waterloo to manage Channel 7, uh, was a corporate executive uh, with the, in the Aflac organization, uh, was head of the NBC affiliates board, and backed his news department through all the years he did, that I worked thick and with thin. him and you yeah. worked with him. That's right. And um, they, were, they were forcing him into compromises that he was not willing to make. That's right. And I think he and I felt similarly. And I'm I, sure you did. And we, we were in a lot of angst. We were, we're still friends and colleagues in many ways. And although his circumstances were different than mine in some respects, uh, ultimately we found ourselves leaving a station that we had a great deal of fondness for. Right. And still do to this day. Of course. Yeah. But uh, it's <coughs> it really, this hour that we've spent here is a remarkable um, short snapshot of the of uh, broadcast new broadcast television because television news didn't begin until the 60s radio news started with Shelley and Gross That's in right. 1936 and they were huge in Des Moines and they were and they yeah. you know built the biggest yeah. one of the biggest radio news departments in the country in the 1940s in this city That's right. WHO That's right. radio and Ronald Reagan was a part and of that. Ronald Reagan was a part of it, yeah. and uh, Shelley. Uh, you know, you, what, what, you you just yeah. can't say enough. About I that. I'm really honored to even be a part of of, of WHO's history too, certainly right. in television. And and I've been fortunate, uh, and I'll say this: uh, uh, I would not have been at KTIV TV, and I would not have been at KWWL TV, and I would not have been at WHO TV <laughs> if it wasn't for Grant Price. And for that, I'm indebted and grateful, and and it's well, been fun to. <laughs> come up underneath somebody like you. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think it's important that that tradition get carried on. And well, I'm delighted that my career played out yeah. over this many years. I think it's important for uh, whoever studies this subject, whenever it is, to understand that there was, I'm gonna, I have to call it a finest hour, and it happened before the end of the 20th century. Uh, it did. I hope it can happen again I in this uh, catapult that we're on now, but in terms of integrity and what uh, what journalism should be doing, uh, television got their hand on that and 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 really shaped it for a while. Well, I think the two key things there. We really had a lot of passion to find out what the truth of the matter was. Right. And uh, the other thing is, we embraced it as a lifestyle. To be a broadcast journalist was to be the same in, in our minds as to be a an attorney, or a doctor, or a priest. Uh, it was a high calling. It's a calling. It was a profession. Right. And we took it as a profession, even if the public didn't always perceive us that way. Right. And because it was a profession, we maintained our own ethic. And I believe that the real challenge to broadcasting today is is that ethic that if the if the baton doesn't get passed on from one generation to another, and people like yourself and Jack Shelley have certainly pass it on to my generation. Hopefully we can pass it on and maybe the, his the circumstances of the history will allow it to refire. I think that there has to be some modification of the management structure in order for that to happen. I'm pessimistic about it at this, I am in too. this year of 2000. It would have to be a transforming because experience the, that we the can. The old uh, irascible horse's ass news directors 
such as me, <laughs> uh, who would throw Those are your a salesman <laughs> out of the newsroom if he would stick his nose in there. Those are your words, but uh, that's right. Well, you're exactly I right. I mean, that, yeah. that, was, the, that yeah. was the philosophy. Yeah. Yeah, it uh, was, and uh, it, but it was backed up by Bill Corton and Bob Buckmaster and Bill Turner and Jim Waterbury and Bill Bolster. That's right. And, that's right. and Bolster is... <laughs> think of well, just talk about Bolster a bit. I mean, again, you you were in college with him. I the, knew Bolster before broadcasting, and Bill's a wonderful guy. Uh -huh. um, he uh, he's a misunderstood guy, and in some ways he doesn't think so. <laughs> he's the, he's the, I'm sure he doesn't, <laughs> and he's he's the victim of legends, I'm sure, and yeah. and um, as as people at his level sometimes are, but. Um, he was very kind to me early in my career and encouraged me uh, when I was a young reporter mm -hmm. to uh, to stay in it. And I don't think any of us ever thought we'd do anything but what we were doing back yeah. then. And people like Bolster and myself and you have, have stayed in it. Yeah. And uh, Bill uh, was a character. Um, uh, that's all I can say. I mean, well, he, he says it. He says in my uh, in one of my senior years at Lawrence, <laughs> he was he was asked to leave St. Thomas. <laughs> And I say that because I was asked to leave Loris, which <laughs> gives you some, in, not because of anything <laughs> that there was any immoral <laughs> crime or anything of that sort, but they had tough rules at mm -hmm. those Catholic men's schools. They wanted you to sign in at midnight, and Bolster and I might be in East Dubuque at midnight. <laughs> it might not be our preference to come back to the dorm and sign in. <laughs> we have stories that I could tell that I would more or less bore people, but, but Bill was a bull in a china closet, and he always, one thing about Bill Bolster, he, he always spoke his piece. Always. And he may have had the benefit that some of us don't uh, in terms of a, a power base where if he, if he did speak his piece and the wrong things mm -hmm. happened, he could probably still pay the rent. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's why he spoke his piece. I think it's because of who Bill Bolster was and is. And uh, I always admired that. I, I don't, don't always agree with him or didn't always agree mm -hmm. with him. And there were things that his style I, uh, at times could be abrasive. But at the time I spent with him, uh, I remember fondly and uh, right. to watch no, his career I, develop. I have the things. greatest respect yeah. for Bill Bull. Well, from, <coughs> from KDKH in Dubuque, he gets to come home to and work for Blackhawk mm -hmm. in Waterloo as a salesperson, moves into radio management, evolves into television management yeah. in the early 80s, and then goes from market number, then I think it was 77 yeah. maybe, to uh, St. Louis. Right, Metro, Me and then eventually to uh, Cincinnati with Metro Media, and then eventually uh, WNBC. To New York. Yeah, and then and takes them all to the top. Yeah, every one of them. Every one of them. Now, whether it was right place at right time, th you can say it's some of that. And there, there does history make the man, or does the man make history? Well. And with Bolster, it was a little bit of both, really. Well, but, but I really think that Bolster, uh, through your maybe some of your influence, maybe some of mine understood how important news was oh, yeah. and that's the way he turned it around Absolutely. in St. Louis and New York and, too and he did it in New yeah. York yeah. and then NBC sends him to this dumb cable network that they CNBC. have and he revolutionizes yeah. cable television yeah. with CNBC and now he's wandering around in Europe as he's we speak right yeah. he's over there <laughs> trying to build it in Europe yeah. CNBC and International yeah, he'll do well with that he will Waterloo's had a tremendous in eastern Iowa in Iowa uh, and I've lived in other states, uh, so I, when I say this, um, I really mean it. I, I don't know of a state, for instance, where broadcasters took uh, freedom of information to be as important as they did in the state of Iowa. And a lot of it was the Des Moines Register, right. but it wasn't all the Des Moines Register. It wasn't Register. all, because, the, the, again, those hometown broadcasters, yeah. uh, KCRG, KWWL, right. WMT, uh, KCAU, supported the Iowa Freedom of Information right. Council and, and still do and still do and you had Tom Pettit at KWWL in Waterloo right. who went on to NBC uh, you you have uh, Michael Gardner here in Des Moines who went on to NBC and is uh, now back in Des Moines and you had Bolster and uh, mm -hmm. and yourself and the Richard Shelleys Threlkeld and Dennis Swanson and Brian Ross and, and some Brian really Ross. big players and there were others too I didn't mention Gerald Harrington yeah and Norman Schiff, who were both African-American reporters at KWW. And, and, and their careers went on for, for quite a while. Yeah. Um, and they were, they were very dedicated young uh, broadcast journalists at a difficult time. And a guy named Buckmaster gave him a chance Buckmaster to work did. at his station. He opened the door for blacks, 
and women right. in, the, in the newsroom at KWWI. He got on that, um, uh, he got on that program. He, he understood it. We got to do this. He you really know. did. We and can't I think he did it for the right reason. He did it for the right reason. I think he did it for right. the right and reason. And your dad had a big role in that. I think he was behind feature. the scenes on that. That's right. right. Waterloo went through some really tough times in those 60s years. They it did. was one of the most segregated cities in, uh, in the country. Non-questionably. The NAACP, uh, uh, the National Association of Colored People, had targeted uh, Waterloo. And uh, my father was an attorney who, behind the scenes, did a lot of work with minorities. And of course, uh, Buckmaster and a number of those people eventually helped the African American community build its own radio station, right. uh, which I think they were proud of. And, but and they also took the power structure by the lapels in Waterloo and said, "We got to fix this. We they can't did. keep doing this." They did. Although it's funny, coming back years later. Um, I, I think there's still some very serious issues that Waterloo of faces there are. in right. terms of attitude and um, embracing the minority community. Mm -hmm. And until they do that, I think Waterloo's going to struggle. But it's a, it's a night and day from what, from it, what was. it was. You That's know, right. When a black wouldn't have walked into Morse Cafe any more than he would have walked. That's right. And that was in 1969 in Waterloo, Iowa. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it wasn't all the South, folks. It <laughs> certainly wasn't. Mike Beecher, you're. A remarkable guy. We've enjoyed it. Enjoyed this discussion Grant, very much, my good friend. Grant, thanks for your help It's been fun talking to Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, yeah, we could use up a lot of tape here, couldn't we? Well, There's so many stories. Things branch off. There yeah. are, and, you know, you and I could tell stories.